I want you to know that uh, next Sunday, Christmas Eve, Laura is going to lead us in our own caroling. So this was a warm-up, right? I mean, we've heard how you do it now, right? Lance and I got the parts. So Laura's going to lead us next Sunday evening. Actually, 4.30? 5? 4.30 is the Coco. Oh, yes. Coco it's Carol. Coco, and Carols, and Cookies. And then at 5, we'll officially start. So come early and have some refreshments as we start. Now, this morning, you may think that this message is going to sound very academic, even boring. But, uh, well, I want you to know that our faith is not based on fiction, but it's based on fact. The facts of history and the facts of the Word of God. Next week, we'll be leading our worship through the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. And this morning... To complement that, we'll be leading the study through Matthew chapter 1. Now, the Gospels are complementary. They're not redundant, you know. Luke tells us a lot about Mary, and Matthew tells us a lot about Joseph. And that is the character on whom this message is based as he becomes the adoptive father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I borrowed the title of this message from the book called More Than a Carpenter written by Josh McDowell. Now in that book Josh wrote about the evidence of the deity of Christ. Now my focus this morning will be a little bit more narrow as I talk about the evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. I'll also show how Jesus' adoptive father, Joseph, was himself more than a carpenter. He was a man of faith that showed. You know, as we've been teaching through Genesis and the lives of the patriarchs, we've seen faith that showed in the lives of those people. Now, Joseph was a man of faith. He was a man that displayed his faith in courage, in compassion, and godly character. Do you have a slide for that, Ron? In case you wanted a, an outline, you can also ascribe those three C's. You know, if you like alliteration in outlines, it's courage, compassion, and character. Now, to put yourself in Joseph's shoes, imagine yourself engaged and you discover your bride-to-be has become pregnant and you're not the father. Well, this may sound a little scandalous for a Sunday morning family service, but this is history. And today's reading will show Joseph's faith proved. And I pray that it may also bolster your faith. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your word and for substantiating it through history. We pray that it will inspire us to be more faithful and to prove our faith as might be needed as we encounter the challenges of life today. May all of your people gathered here today be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know, I'm going to start with this first verse. And when you hear what God has brought to my heart from this first verse, you may wonder, how is he ever going to get through this whole chapter? But be patient. Verse 1 says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, most fairy tales and fictional stories start out with once upon a time or 
a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But Matthew starts out with a genealogy to show that what he's about to say really happened. It's important to know the credentials of the main subject of Matthew's gospel, Jesus, because knowing who he is makes it easier to believe what he said. He had credibility. Now, unlike other philosophical writings of the time, Matthew's gospel is about a person and not just his teachings. You know, teachings are only as trustworthy as the teacher. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they're all dead. Buddha, Confucius, and Mohammed are all dead. But Jesus proved the trustworthiness of his teachings by who he is and what he did. He is the Son of God. He proved it by miracles, including coming back from the dead. In doing so, he did what we cannot do for ourselves. He died for our sin, and he was then raised from the dead to prove the validity of his sacrifice. And furthermore, he was seen by hundreds of witnesses who were persecuted for their testimony and died as martyrs because they refused to shut up. Now, Christianity is believable because it's historical. Many religions have been started by people with no credentials. Some founders have claimed miraculous experiences, but there are no witnesses. Their teachings are not to be believed because they are mere men or women who have no more credibility than you or I. Actually less, because we have the life of Christ within us who believe in him. Now, Matthew emphasized the historical nature of his book by its title. You notice he didn't title his gospel with his own name as was common. That was done later. The original title of the book was The Genealogy of Jesus Christ, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham. This is a historical biography. Now, if what Matthew wrote was not authoritative and accurate, it would not have been accepted by the early church where there were eyewitnesses to the miracles that he wrote about. The Gospel of Matthew would not have been included in the Bible. Instead, it would have been sent to the fiction section of the downtown Jerusalem library. The Christian faith is based on historical fact, not fiction. Now, Matthew is the first gospel written. It's the gospel most often read and the gospel that makes the strongest connection to the Old Testament as it starts with the genealogy we're going to read. Now, admittedly, genealogies are boring. We tend to skip over them because we can't even pronounce their names. But why is genealogy important? It links Jesus Christ to Abraham and David through whom the promise of God was to come. The covenants from God to his people. It reveals to the Jewish reader that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Now, just for your, your, uh, your uh, knowledge of prophecies, there's more than 300 Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. So for one man to have fulfilled this is pretty incredible, defying of the odds. God gave messianic 
prophecy through at least 10 different prophets over a period of 2,000 years. In addition, God also gave us pictures of the Messiah through what we call types. And as we've studied recently, Isaac was a type of Christ who foreshadowed his sacrifice. Remember, God told Abraham to sacrifice his only son, the one he loved, on Mount Moriah. And Jesus is God's only son who he loved and sacrificed on Calvary, which, by the way, is on Mount Moriah. Isaac was at least 18 years old and could have fought off his 120-year-old father, but he willingly let Abraham sacrifice him. Jesus willingly laid down his life. And it's important to know that no one took it from him. He willingly gave up his life for us. Now, what's the significance of being the son of Abraham and the son of David if you're not Jewish? Well, Abraham, we know, is the father of the faith. He was an example. He was justified by faith, which we should emulate. He was given the covenant of God's blessing for future generations. In Genesis 22, verses 17 through 18, God said to Abraham, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, keyword, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So who else of Abraham's descendants would bring a blessing to all the nations except Christ? Jesus fulfilled this promise. In John 3.16, he said, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We are recipients of God's blessing, the blessing that he promised to all nations through Christ. And Abraham was justified by faith, and so were we who believe in Christ. Well, it was also prophesied that the Messiah would be a son of David. God made a covenant promise with David in 2 Samuel 7:12 saying when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers i will set up your seed after you who will come from your own body and i will establish your kingdom he shall build a house for my name and i will establish the throne of his kingdom forever, keyword. David's son Solomon built the temple, but his kingdom didn't last forever. In fact, it was destroyed. Only the Messiah would establish the everlasting kingdom. He could do that because he was raised from the dead and is therefore able to, to fulfill the promise of a second coming to establish a thousand-year reign on the earth. Isaiah 11, 1 says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, this refers to life springing out of the line of David after Israel had been destroyed. Now, many families' lineages were lost, but not David's, as we're going to read in a minute. And Isaiah continues, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. 
Jesse was David's father through the line of the messianic king who was to come. The, the word branch is a messianic title God also used when he spoke through Jeremiah and Zechariah. Jeremiah 23, 5 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. He will be called the Lord our righteousness. This prophecy speaks of both the first coming and second coming of the Messiah. The Lord gives prophecy through Isaiah in chapter 11, verse 10, which says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. Well, you know he is speaking about Jesus, for after his death and resurrection, Jesus ascended into heaven in the glory of his Father, where he sits at his right hand. God also says in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, these familiar words, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall rest on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. The kingdom Christ established at his first coming was a spiritual one. But when he comes again, his kingdom will be a physical one when he reigns over the earth for a thousand years. Okay, now, that's verse 1. And I promise you the rest of it will move more rapidly. So now, for the genealogy, <laughs> verse 2. See if I can get through it. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Abinadab, and Abinadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begot Rehoboam, Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa. And Asa begot Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham. Jotham begot Ahaz, and Hazaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh. Manasseh begot Ammon. Ammon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begot Abiadab, and Abiad uh, begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor, and Azor begot Zadok, and Zadok begot Achim, and Achim begot Eliud, and Eliud begot Eleazar, Eleazar begot Matin, and Matin begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. <sighs> well, right. It's important who was not begotten. You'll see. Let's make some observations here. 
It's no coincidence that Matthew breaks this down into three sets of 14 generations. From Abraham to Jake, uh, David was the first. From David to captivity was the second. And then from captivity to Jesus was the third. Matthew does this more for organization than for comprehensiveness. Because, admittedly, this genealogy is not complete. It actually skips some people who we can find to fill in the gaps if we wanted to. But even though Matthew skipped a couple of generations, the one he didn't skip are significant because they are evidence of accuracy in Scripture. For one thing, the genealogy includes embarrassing details. First, it includes four women. Now, it was not customary to mention women in genealogies of that day. And Luke's genealogy, for example, only mentions men. Furthermore, two of the women were Gentiles, and three of the women had moral failures, not the kind of family tree you would want, unless you were the Messiah who wanted to be known by his people and to have come from the line of Abraham and David. Now, just get give you a brief summary here. Tamar, remember her? She disguised herself as a prostitute so that her father-in-law would unknowingly impregnate her to bear the sons Para and Zara for her dead husband. You have to go back and read that story. It's true what I'm saying. Rahab was a Gentile prostitute in Jericho who believed in God and repented. She's actually mentioned in the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11, 31, where it says, by faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she helped the spies. And Rahab was the mother of Boaz who married Ruth. Boaz and Ruth were great-grandparents of David. Now, Ruth was also a Gentile. So even before Christ's birth, God had brought the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant to Gentiles. You notice that? And finally, there is Bathsheba, who is not even mentioned by name in this genealogy. And though she committed adultery with David, they later married and she bore him Solomon, who continued the line of Abraham and David to Christ. Now, these embarrassing details show us two things. First, God chose Gentiles to be a part of his family of faith. And we're reminded that it is not those who were born children of Abraham who are chosen, but those who are chosen and respond by faith, as Abraham did. Now, you remember early on, Ishmael and Esau, they went their own way. They departed from the faith, and their descendants have been at war with Israel for the last 4,000 years. Now, second is that embarrassing details were not included in the genealogies of other great men of the time. This is unusual. This is evidence that Matthew wrote exactly what God wanted him to write. The genealogy wasn't edited to show only the good like we were doing if we were to write our own autobiography. I'm going to leave that out. It also shows the bad and the ugly. The good, the bad, and the ugly. It shows that even in the lineage of the Savior, there were sinners who represented God's grace. Now, I'm sure Peter 
would have liked it if Matthew would have omitted some of his mistakes from the gospel. But God includes them to show that Peter is only human and prone to sin like all of us. The Bible is believable because it tells it like it is, not as a fairy tale. There's one more detail I want to point out that Lance was quick to see right away. Notice in verse 16, it says, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. The word begot was not used because Joseph did not begot Jesus. The words of whom are singular and refer only to Mary. That's right. Verse 18 and 19. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Matthew doesn't really tell us about the birth of Jesus or Mary, his mother. Luke does that. Instead, Matthew tells us about Joseph, Jesus' adoptive father. Now, he was more than a carpenter. He was a man of courage, compassion, and character. Just like Mary, Joseph was chosen by God for a special assignment. Well, he could have bailed out when he learned that Mary was pregnant, but he obeyed God. Now, in case you wanted to know, there are actually three steps to marriage in the Jewish culture. First, there was the engagement, which was usually arranged by parents when the bride and groom were quite young. And then second, there was a betrothal, which was made by the intended bride and groom with their parents' blessing when they got older. And it made the engagement official and was just as binding as marriage, but without the privileges. During betrothal, a couple was considered married, except they didn't live together. Betrothal could only be broken by divorce for the reason of sexual immorality. And betrothal typically lasted a year, during which time the couple would make preparations. The husband-to-be would add a bedroom to his parents' house and find some used furniture on Craigslist. <laughs> Just kidding. Joseph was a carpenter, but more than a carpenter. Well, and he, the bride-to-be would gather a wardrobe, make a wedding dress, copy her mother's recipes, and make sure to cancel her Coles card. She would also be sure that Joseph had made a dresser so he wouldn't leave his clothes on the floor. And then third, only after the wedding was the marriage consummated or completed with living together. Now, Matthew clearly states that Joseph and Mary had practiced abstinence before marriage. This is important because of the consequences prescribed by the law, you know, because people would assume that this pregnancy was caused by out of, out of wedlock uh, conduct. Now, Joseph could divorce Mary, or even worse, she could be stoned according to the law for adultery. Now, no one would believe that she had not slept with a man because that's the only way a woman could get pregnant, short of a miracle. And that's what we're talking about. Such a miracle had never happened before. Now, 
I think God actually arranged for Caesar Augustus to order a census for two reasons. To get Jacob and Mary out of Nazareth where they were being condemned and persecuted and also to fulfill the prophecy that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5.2 says, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be a ruler of Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting, from eternity past. Now this is significant because people assumed Jesus had been born in Nazareth and doubted that he was the Messiah at first. In John 1.45, for example, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? When Jesus was teaching in Galilee, some said, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was born? That's John 7:41. So that's why God caused Jesus to be born in Bethlehem. Not accident, not coincidence, not to make the song have sense. As I said earlier, God chose Joseph just as he chose Mary. This is important because Joseph would face a unique dilemma. Would he feel betrayed by her pregnancy and divorce her to preserve his own reputation and integrity as a godly man? Would he feel betrayed by Mary but want to stay with her to protect her because he loved her. Joseph had three attributes that made him God's choice for this challenge. First, he was in the line of David. Second, it says he was a just man, which meant that he was compassionate and kind. And third, we'll find that he was a true believer who wanted to act according to God's will. God made Joseph's decision easier by sending an angel. Now, in verse 20, we continue and read, But while Joseph thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The angel assures Joseph that Mary did not cheat on him. She was pregnant supernaturally with no human involvement. As Luke 135 tells us, the angel Gabriel spoke to Mary and said to her, the Holy Spirit has come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now it's clear that God's role for Joseph was for him to be the adoptive father. And it's a very important role. The angel says to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. God called Joseph to marry Mary, to be the adoptive father, and to call the child Jesus. Mary was also Told the name of the child would be Jesus in Luke 131. And it's important to know that the name Jesus means the Lord is salvation. 
He came to save us from our sins. Now verse 22. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. This quotation is of a prophecy in Isaiah 7.14. It would be fulfilled in the second name that Jesus was given, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Once previously with Julie, someone uh, mentioned to me that I shouldn't talk so long because as Paul was speaking in Ephesus, the young man Eutychus fell out of the window. <laughs> and uh, we pray for anybody at any time it might be necessary, so it's not any embarrassment to interrupt the service to render care. And I'm thankful that you all... You all accept that, and, uh, and uh, there's no sense of panic here. We're in the Lord's hands. So as you're finding your places again, we'll, we'll just resume and uh, finish up. Let me uh, offer a prayer for Julie right now, as I did when we first attended to her. Heavenly Father, we know that our lives are in your hands. And some of us have conditions that make our lives a lot more tenuous. We thank you for the trust that you've given us in your care and your plan for us. And we pray that you'd bless these attendants who've helped Julie and that you would bless her with your presence as she goes for further evaluation and care and look forward to seeing her again next week and ask that lord if it's possible you would you would make uh, may give understanding to the causes of of her blackouts so that she might not be endangered by them or uh, or fearful and lord we just ask you to continue ministering to us through your word and let us let us take what you want us to receive uh, from our time of worship and your word together this morning. Amen. Well, I think I was around verse 23, 22. Yeah, 22. Uh, but uh, I'll finish this up. It's only a couple more verses. Yeah, 22. And then, uh, yeah. 22 says, So all this is done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And this is a quotation that you recognize from Isaiah 7:14. And the name Emmanuel speaks of who Jesus was. He was God. Now, only God could save us, and that's who Jesus is. I think I spoke those words right when Julie went down. So we can have that hope for her or for anyone else who might be suffering a, a life-threatening condition. Now, verse 24, ending this chapter. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Jesus, or Joseph, showed his faith by obeying God. He took Mary to be his wife, kept her a virgin, and called the name of the child Jesus. And later he obeyed God, in fleeing to, Jesus, to Egypt with Jesus and Mary to protect them. And after Herod died, Joseph obeyed God in returning to Israel. Now, 
The first test was the biggest because it required Joseph to believe God about Mary's pregnancy and to take her as his wife. Now, there may be some who doubt the virgin birth. And they're also likely to doubt creation or the flood or the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Now, as we learned from studying the lives of the patriarchs, God expects to see faith with feet. Faith with feet from those he calls. Abraham showed his faith by offering Isaac. Isaac showed his faith by accepting a mail order bride in Rebecca. Rebecca showed her faith in leaving her home and marrying a man she'd never seen 500 miles away. Jacob showed his faith in leaving his home where he was promised to be the heir of Isaac's estate in order to take a wife from his mother's family in Haran and work for 14 years while his inheritance was back in Canaan. Now, if our faith is true, we will obey God because we can trust him. Let us show, as Joseph did, by actions, our complete surrender to God's will. Let us pray as Jesus did, not my will, but your will be done. Joseph also showed his character as a believer. You've heard the saying, true character is what you are when nobody's looking. In Joseph's case, godly character was shown by his actions when everybody was looking. It was not his fault that Mary was pregnant, but he suffered the public shame and persecution along with her. Was there anyone who would go with them to help them on their journey to Bethlehem? Did anyone lend a cart for Mary to ride in? Did anyone give up their room at the inn in Bethlehem to a woman who was in labor? True faith and godly character must sometimes stand alone, as Joseph did. May God grant us the faith and courage of Joseph to stand alone when we must, to stand against persecution and ridicule from unbelievers. And, Laura, do you want to do the offering song? Yeah? Okay. Well, the offering song, The Birthday of a King, is about Bethlehem. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of being born there, and God used Joseph to make sure that Mary got there. So Joseph had a significant role in the birth of Jesus, even though he was only the adoptive father. And his example of compassion, commitment, and character is one that we can be inspired by. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning. And... Uh, May we remember these things that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.